And we move on to our next speaker, um, Maria Sachkova. She um, is currently a lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Bristol, just uh, west from here. And she, for me, is famous for having done uh, some very outstanding work on the venom system of nematostella factensis, the model C anemone. But she's also worked on uh, spider venom toxins and on neuropeptides and the nervous system structure in comb jelly. So um, a, a broad tableau of interests. Uh, and today she's going to talk about her work in the Matostella. So uh, Maria, thank you for joining us. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and uh, inv uh, invitation to this uh, nice seminar. So yes, today I will be talking about um, Ecology and Evolution of Venom uh, in Cyanemone nematostella. And even though currently I am in, uh, in the University of Bristol, oy, uh, this work was done when I was uh, a postdoc with Ihu Moran in uh, Israel, which is right here in the middle of the globe. And I used to work on the ecology and evolution of uh, the venom in Cyanemone nematostella. So that, this is a really uh, great venom, um, venomous organism because unlike many other organisms, it's a quite well-established lab model. So you can culture uh, these animals in the lab and they will be available throughout the year. And you can do a lot of um, advanced molecular biology uh, methods in it. For example, uh, you can make transgenic animals and this will allow you uh, monitoring uh, the toxin um, production, uh, the dynamics of toxin production in different uh, conditions, and you can do it in very uh, great uh, details. So uh, let's talk about the uh, about the ecology of, uh, of the uh, Cyanium nematostella. So as all the Nidarians, it is a venomous uh, organism, and it also goes through the complex life cycle. When uh, nematostella is adult, uh, it looks like a polyp, which uh, uh, sits in the mud in the bottom of these uh, lagoons, and it only leaves the uh, denticles exposed outside. And when it is young, it is represented by a, sm a very small uh, motile planula or larva called planula. And uh, there is a difference um, between the adult and the larva in terms that um, the larva doesn't feed and uh, uh, the polyp uh, does feed. So because of uh, the differences in the size and the feeding behaviors in the lifestyle, the interactions with their natural predators in prey uh, differ throughout life cycle of this animal. Uh, and examples of natural predators are grass shrimps and some uh, fish called mamichog, and uh, natural prey can be uh, insect larvae which live in the same uh, in the same lagoons. Uh, so, um, yes, so here are some examples of nematostella, um, uh, nematostella hunting behavior. So when you try to feed it with the small uh, grass, sorry, uh, artemia shrimps, uh, they get stuck to the tentacles and then uh, they get killed by the venom and nematostella puts them into the mouth. So as you probably know, uh, the venom is um, uh, contained within the stinging cells called nematocysts. And uh, when you touch uh, the animal, they get discharged and they inject the venom. Uh, however, part of nematocysts, there are other kinds of venom producing cells called um, ectodermal gland cells. So they just secrete a lot of venom components. And both cell types are distributed throughout the body of the adult polyp and the larva in the larva of planula. Basically, both uh, life stages are venomous. And also, unlike many other venom organisms, venomous organisms, uh, these animals don't have any uh, defined uh, venom gland. They, the stinging cells are distributed. The, the stinging cells and the ectodermal gland cells are distributed throughout the body. Uh, and now I will be talking about several of my projects, uh, which I've done uh, during my time as a postdoc. So the first one uh, is about the mechanism of uh, toxin evolution in uh, this uh, C anemone. Uh, 
So nimetastella has uh, multiple uh, toxins and one of the major uh, venom components is called NV1. And NV1 is the, uh, produced by ectodermal uh, gland cells. And it is known uh, that it is uh, highly toxic to uh, shrimps. So if you inject NV1 into shrimps, they will die immediately. And if you incubate um, fish larvae with NV1 toxin, it will also affect them, but a bit later, within one hour. And then um, there are uh, several homologs of this toxin. Um, two of them called, are called NV5 and NV4. And they have uh, quite different activity from NV1. So uh, both of them don't have any effects on the shrimps, but uh, they do affect fish. So fish will be killed, like here we use fish larvae, they will be killed with, within 30 or 40 uh, minutes. Uh, another difference between this uh, NV5 and NV4 and NV1 is that uh, these two toxins, NV4 and NV5, are larval toxins. They are produced in the ectodermal gland cells of larvae, while NV1 is an adult uh, venom component. Uh, so if we look in the evolution of this uh, uh, venom toxin gene family, we uh, can assume, or we can propose um, a mechanism of uh, the evolution of these um, um, genes. So most probably, they, uh, there used to be an NV1-like ancestral gene, uh, which probably uh, uh, which probably was uh, uh, very similar to NV1 uh, with the uh, with the anti shrimp activity and the strong uh, sodium channel inhibiting activity, and then there were multiple gene duplications. Sometimes uh, they, they, which could have been either in the same genome locus or they could have been accompanied by translocation to a uh, distant uh, genomic loci. And then uh, different copies underwent different um, um, processes. Uh, multiple NV1 copies were highly conserved uh, through the um, uh, gene, uh, uh, through the consorted uh, evolution. And this uh, has been shown by you um, quite a long time ago. So NV1 has multiple uh, copies. It's produced in a very high uh, levels and all the copies are nearly identical. And all this uh, gene, all these uh, products have, um, strong anti-shrimp activity and weak anti-fish activity. And then NV4 and NV5, uh, they, their sequence diverged quite significantly from NV1, and they acquired um, new functions. Uh, so they uh, stopped being adult, an adult toxin, they became a larval toxin. And uh, on the other hand, uh, they acquired a strong anti-fish activity and lost anti-shrimp activity. And uh, this is one option, or if the ancestral gene combined all of this function, then what happened to NV4 and NV5 was that they underwent subfunctionalization where uh, they retained the uh, only part of the activities, basically anti-fish activity, while um, NV1 retained the anti-shrimp activity. Also, there are several pseudo, uh, pseudo genes which just, um, have no function. So uh, we can say that uh, these uh, toxins of this uh, big gene family uh, evolve through uh, the birth and uh, death mechanism is in nematostel. Okay, so in the next project, uh, I've studied a different toxin uh, family and um, it is also about the evolution of uh, new uh, components in this family. So we know that uh, the stinging cells, uh, nematocytes, they are uh, related to uh, neurons uh, in different ways. So first of all, they uh, in both nematocytes and neurons uh, share the same um, precursor in the development. So uh, they develop from the uh, same um, precursor cell on one hand. On the other hand, if we look at the structure of this uh, stinging cells, we can notice that first of all, they have they normally have a sensory structure on top, like an endocell. So if you touch it, uh, the signal gets detected. And on the other hand, in the bottom, they have these long processes, which look very, pretty much like uh, neurites. Also, uh, nematocytes, 
they are physically connected to neurons through synapses. So there is probably a neural regulation of nematocyte activity. And this is um, how it looks if you uh, if you touch cyanemone uh, and they discharge the venom. Um, yes, I wanted to mention that uh, unlike neurons, uh, nematocytes evolved this capsule which has venom. So that's an innovation of the cell type. Okay, so in this project, we wanted to find new uh, components uh, of the venom, which uh, would be similar to the well-characterized um, potassium channel uh, toxin uh, from uh, cyanemone stichodactyla. So that toxin is called SHK, and um, we uh, searched um, for new uh, components based on the similarity, on the sequence similarity in the nematostella transcriptome. And we found several new uh, sequences which look like a putative um, uh, venom precursor, sorry, toxin precursors. So they had uh, this um, uh, part with uh, several cysteines, which were arranged into the same pattern as uh, in the SHK toxin. And then there is a cleavage site here. So most probably this is uh, how the precursor cle uh, gets cleaved and uh, uh, the mature peptides um, basically shorter peptides with uh, several 3D sulfide bonds. Uh, however, surprisingly, it turned out that only uh, one of this uh, gene was produced by stinging cells. So if we look at this uh, in situ hybridization uh, staining, uh, we can see that um, uh, in both planula and polyps, uh, this uh, uh, gene is expressed in the cells, uh, which have this empty spot in the middle. So this empty spot corresponds to this capsule and uh, the staining is RNA based. So RNA is, uh, is um, all around this capsule. So that's how we can recognize uh, the cells as nematocytes. And then if we purify the capsules, the nematocysts and uh, run proteomics, we can uh, detect this uh, SHK like one peptide among other uh, known venom components of nematostellum. So this suggests that this uh, gene SHK like one is indeed uh, produced by stinking cells and is uh, probably a toxin. However, other new peptides were lo uh, localized to uh, neurons. So you can see here the cells with long branching neurites and they correspond to um, uh, ganglion cells of um, uh, the nervous system, nematostella. Uh, other uh, homologs were localized also to other cell types like uh, uh, sensory neurons, but I'm not showing here. Okay, so two of these um, new genes, SHK like one and SHK like two, have quite similar uh, sequence. Um, they're quite similar in their sequence and also in predicted structures. However, one of them is produced by neurons, SHK like two, and another one is produced by stinging cells. So we wanted to characterize the um, uh, functional activity. And for that, uh, uh, I produced uh, recombinant uh, peptides and uh, tested them uh, on the uh, zebrafish larvae and also on the polyps um, itself. So both uh, peptides turned out to be toxic to zebrafish larvae uh, with a small difference. It looks like SHK like one is a bit more potent uh, for against the zebrafish larvae. And if we uh, incubate nematostella polyps with these uh, peptides, surprisingly, both of them provoke uh, contraction in these polyps. So um, maybe this reaction is not that surprising for SHK like 2 because it is produced by neurons and probably it has some internal regulatory function. So if, it probably acts as a neuropeptide. However, um, SHK like 1 is produced by the nematocyte, so it's supposed to be a venomous uh, venom component, um, but it still retains this function, this ability to affect the nematostella body itself. So if we take a look at the phylogeny of uh, uh, these uh, genes in uh, cyanemonies, we can see that uh, last common ancestor of um, um, of all the cyanemones probably had a gene, uh, SHK like uh, two gene, which was probably neuropeptide produced by neurons. 
And the SHK like one is detected only in nematostella. So this uh, SHK like one production by nematocytes is a nematostella specific uh, feature. And uh, this let us um, propose a scenario where probably there used to be an SHK like two norofeptide gene, which underwent duplication in nematostella. And then one of the copies retained the neuropeptide function, uh, while the other copy uh, moved into the switched expression into the venom system. However, because they are uh, they have the uh, they share the evolutionary origin and they still uh, share a lot of sequence similarity, uh, their function um, in the in vitro test looks quite similar. Both of them still retain activity against. Uh, uh, fish and um, they can also provoke contractions in the same in the nematostella. But because they're produced by different systems in vivo, it's likely that uh, uh, the neuropeptide function is only uh, uh, typical for SHK like 2, which is produced by neurons, while the toxic function is probably typical for SHK like 1, which is produced by nematocytes. But anyway, it's a uh, this mechanism is an interesting example of uh, recruitment of uh, uh, components of nervous system into the venom uh, system. And now I want to sh quickly show you two projects which are um, uh, showing that uh, venom uh, of uh, nematostella is regulated uh, based on the interactions uh, with multiple biotic and abiotic factors. So this is the more ecological uh, part of the talk. So first of all, we showed that uh, oxygen, so uh, that venom production is metabolically expensive in nematostella. So if we discharge, if we treat nematostella and make it discharge uh, its venom, uh, then, and after that we measure the consumption of uh, oxygen, we can see that uh, oxygen consumption increases after the discharge. Uh, so it means that the uh, nematostella consumes more oxygen and its metabolic uh, rate increases. So uh, to replenish the venom, it needs to invest a lot of energy. And um, using transcriptomic, we also show, sorry, it was encounter measurements. We also showed that after the discharge, the um, uh, toxin production uh, increases. So indeed, once you discharge all the venom components, they have to be uh, remade, um, and uh, that um, costs a lot of energy for nematostella. So because uh, it's so, ven um, so metabolically expensive, the venom production is probably regulated um, in nematostella. So we checked how the uh, venom uh, uh, we check the dynamics of venom uh, production throughout the different life stages. And uh, as you can see here, uh, some toxic uh, toxins are highly enriched in the larvae, uh, some are highly enriched in polyps, and some are even enriched in the very early developmental stages like X. So here is an example for three of them. You can see that this toxin, for example, is absent in X. And then in larvae, it starts being produced and then it retains the same level throughout the life. On the other hand, there are larval, or larval or egg specific toxins, which are highly expressed in the uh, um, beginning of the life cycle. And then in the polyps, uh, the expression uh, drops and then peaks again in the females, which produce uh, eggs. So this is um, uh, an example showing that an example of uh, transgenic animal where the toxin was labeled with fluorescent protein. And we can see that it is expressed um, starting from the larva and then uh, through metamorphosis. And um, it is also present in the polyp. And this trans transgenic approach uh, allows to see that uh, this uh, peptide is localized uh, to nematocytes and also that not every nematocyte expresses this um, toxin. So we can see that there is a difference between toxin uh, producing uh, cells. Um, okay, so uh, this differences in venom production um, suggests that it, it is maybe due to different um, interactions uh, with different prey and predators. So here we did an experiment where we placed a nematostella into the 
it's natural or almost natural uh, environment where basically it was sitting in the mud. And here you can see a shrimp coming. So this shrimp, it quickly jumps away once it uh, comes uh, into a contact with nematostella. And this actually correlates with the fact that in, uh, that adult nematostella produces uh, a lot of anti-shrimp and V1 uh, toxin. On the other hand, if we incubate a uh, nematostella larvae with a fish larva, fish will try to eat the, the, the nematostella larva. However, obviously it, um, it doesn't really like it, it spits, it spits it out. And um, that correlates with the fact that uh, the nematostella larva has multiple uh, toxins, which are, um, which are efficient or active against the fish. So uh, because there is a high metabolic cost um, uh, involved in uh, into venom production, uh, it's very probable that not that uh, there is a regulation uh, in. Um, venom production and for example larva doesn't produce much of uh, nv1 toxin but instead it is focused on production of the toxins which uh, def uh, deter fish so this is important for uh, the survival of the animal on the other hand uh, the uh, the adult polyps are focused on production of the anti-shrimp uh, uh, toxins because shrimps can eat um, the polyps basically uh, and in this project, we checked uh, how the toxin production uh, is regulated uh, according to the mm, abiotic factors. So we sampled uh, uh, we sampled multiple populations of nematostella, uh, and like starting from the north to the south uh, in the North America, and then uh, yes, and this population live in quite different climatic conditions, uh, and then we subjected them to the heat stress and uh, checked the expression of, changing the expression of heat shock proteins and NV1 uh, toxin. NV1 is really highly expressed toxin. So uh, it was, its uh, production was significantly reduced in multiple populations uh, in the North. However, in the South, in the South and North Carolina population, um, it, the production of NV1 toxin was not really affected. So uh, to understand it in more detail, we, we focused on this uh, uh, Northern Massachusetts population and Southern North Carolina populations. And uh, uh, the, the next step, we basically checked more the, the expression of more uh, venom components. So uh, yes, basically uh, the uh, North Carolina population uh, it uh, lives in much much warmer uh, weather conditions. So this is a experimentally measured temperature uh, in the water during the one year during 2016, and this is the heat shock that we used. So we can see that there are many days uh, in the south where the temperature naturally reaches this uh, 36 degrees, while in the north, there are way less uh, days when the temperature uh, reaches 36 degrees. So uh, it seems that um, southern population is adapted to this uh, hot weather. And because of that, uh, when we subject it to the heat stress, the toxin produ production in the south doesn't really change, while uh, in the north, it uh, reduces a lot. And in the nature, the stresses don't come uh, one by one. So normally the heat stress would be combined also by increasing the salinity and by high UV light um, exposure. So we also checked out this combined stress um, conditions and we saw that uh, um, the, there were a lot of effects on uh, gene expression, but importantly, and we want toxin, a gene was the most down-regulated gene in the northern uh, Massachusetts population. And this trend was also detected at the level of um, uh, protein. Uh, so we, we did mass spectrometry and we saw that in uh, Massachusetts, the production of NV1 is less after the stress compared to the North Carolina population. So um, now uh, let's uh, conclude all this work. So basically, um, uh, during my postdoc time, I managed 
uh, we managed to show that um, toxins evolve through the um, birth and death mechanisms and also from through recruitment from nervous system to venom uh, in the Sanyamuni uh, nematostella. And then we could also show that venom composition is regulated across the uh, life cycle according to the interaction uh, with predators and prey. And uh, because the venom has high metabolic cost, uh, the venom, the environmental stress uh, regulates the venom production. And the reactions to the stress differ between, between populations adapted to different uh, environmental uh, conditions. And now I want to briefly mention what I am planning to do since um, now I moved to the University of Bristol and started my independent lecture position. So hopefully I will be able to go back to study venom at some point. And so far I was focused on the non-symbiotic Cyanemone nematostella. However, many other Cyanemones and their relatives, uh, corals, they are symbiotic animals. And um, it's known that symbiotic corals, uh, they form very rich ecosystems, uh, like coral reefs. However, when you stress corals, they bleach and basically they lose their uh, symbionts. And this is a big stress for this animal because symbionts provide, uh, uh, provide uh, sugars um, to the animal, to the coral. So if you if uh, the animals if the coral spends too long time without the symbionts, eventually it dies. Uh, however, it's also known that both sea anemones and uh, corals they uh, can prey, uh, and uh, they prey on this, for example, small invertebrates, and for that um, they use venom. And it's also known that um, when uh, a coral uh, is bleached the importance of heterotrophic carbon increases relatively to uh, the symbiotic uh, state um, of this coral. So uh, these uh, facts um, uh, suggest that feeding uh, uh, on, on, uh, on feeding and prey uh, might be a key factor uh, allowing corals to survive bleaching. And venom is uh, basically a key component of the uh, predation uh, behavior in these uh, animals. However, uh, even though um, it's known that uh, corals have uh, nematocytes and uh, some uh, toxins have been isolated, it's completely unknown how the venom is involved in, um, the, how the, the role of the venom is uh, in bleaching is completely understudied. So I'm thinking of studying uh, venom as an evolutionary adaptation to overcome uh, short bleaching stress in corals. And um, for that, I will compare uh, bleached and symbiotic animals and uh, do, we'll do it through different populations, living in different um, environmental conditions and also across different life stages using um, molecular uh, methods such as transcriptomics, transgenics, and also uh, uh, toxicity tests on the native prey. And at this point, I would like to finish and thank all the um, uh, collaborators and former colleagues who were involved in these projects. And uh, many thanks for listening to me. So yes, I'm done. Thank you, Maria. I will clap with my actual hands. That was excellent. Uh, I was all already aware of a, a big chunk of uh, the, your previous work, but uh, your, your your new research sounds really exciting. Before I make a comment on that, uh, is there anybody who has a question or a comment? <laughs> yes, Gregor. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. Hi, Maria. Hi. Uh, very, very nice um, lecture. Fantastic Thanks. results. Um, um, very nice set of different methods that you use, and it's really nice to see um, how far you took this um, project and topic. Uh, maybe just two, two, two brief questions. I found it interesting that you find RNA in nematocysts. Did I understand correctly? Uh, 
um, not exactly. So uh, nematocyst sits, sits within the cell nematocyte. <laughs> so RNA is on is outside of the nematocyte. So RNA oh, okay. is the cytoplasm of nematocyte. So that's okay. why when you look at the staining, you mm -hmm. see like a, an empty part which is nematocyst. It doesn't have RNA, and RNA is all outside. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your in your research, you were studying uh, these smaller peptidic uh, toxins that act on ion channels. But in nematostella, there are also performing toxins. Uh, yes. No, is I, it true? Um, I think there are. But, okay, right now, to be honest, I don't remember exactly, but it most probable that there are some. But I was focused on this. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the cysteine-rich. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, the, the question is the question is whether it is known uh, what's the biological role of these other toxins. Uh, do, do you have any idea where, where they could act or, or why would uh, nematostella produce them? Um, right now, to be honest, I don't remember many. Ah, there are some. Yes, but sorry, <laughs> I don't yeah. really remember. It's off topic, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, no problem. I see that in the chat, uh, Irina has posted uh, a question. Um, does NV1 have effect on humans and, and what could be the target? I think NV1 has uh, effect on um, uh, sodium channels of uh, in, um, arthropods. So uh, I think it's um, uh, qu quite selective for, this, for the arthropods. Uh, like it, even though it has effect on fish, it's much slower. So, uh, like uh, fish is a close relative to <laughs> humans relative to arthropods. <laughs> so, uh, I guess it probably may have some, but uh, much weaker. Like if you touch nematostella, nothing happens to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. if you inject NV1 into shrimps, they die right away. So it's very strong for them. Um, yeah, for the arthropods. Mm. Any other comments or questions? I'm, I'm just very excited about your new project as well because you know it touches on an incredibly neglected question, at least in in the phenomics community, which is venom plasticity. It's like whether with a given genotype, you can create depending on environmental triggers, mm -hmm. different venom compositions or expression levels. So that's why you you know the work on uh, uh, environmental stressors that you did uh, with Jay, who was already cool. But what you're going to do now with the bleaching, I think that's an excellent and original thing. I look forward yeah. to it. I mean, I just I, I'm traveling to Madrid tomorrow to get some mm -hmm. sea urchin tissue samples sequenced because. Sort of interested in a similar question, at least conceptually similar. Uh, as environmental change and climate change happens, we want to use that as a way to uh, give funders an opportunity to give us money. It's like, look, climate change can affect venom systems, perhaps if they're plastic. You know, if you change pH and temperature and salinity and all that stuff, if that messes around with their defensive and predatory weapons, we should mm -hmm. study this. So I've done an experiment in Scotland where we uh, basically exposed sea urchins. Mm -hmm. so predator triggers, environmental predator triggers or not mm -hmm. to see if they will change the expression of defensive toxins because that's yeah. never been done. And they are a, a very good system for studying plasticity in any way. So mm -hmm. tomorrow I'm going to go uh, bring those to the sequencing lab and see if we can get some data. So I look forward to uh, awesome. that. But yeah, I think that whole topic, anybody here study venom plasticity, we need to know more about this because in the best studied venomous taxa, take snakes as the, the paragon, there's not much plasticity. I'm not sure if a lot of work has focused on studying the topic, but if you take a bow drops from the jungle and you keep it in the lab for 20 years, feeding it dead mice, its venom profile is stagnant. So maybe... Okay. So it's 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 these invertebrates we love so much we should study. Yes. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited about this topic. Hope I will manage to do something in it, but yeah, uh, I think it would be cool. It would be cool to... Just like, yeah, this uh, coral bleaching is such a big problem, but nobody is really looking uh, on the natural adaptation. Or oh, maybe people do look, but not on venom <laughs> as a natural uh, adaptation. How, yeah, mm -hmm. which may help uh, corals to like because for short time they can survive 
uh, without uh, the symbiosis. It's just that when it's long, they die. So yeah. Yeah, maybe if we know more, it may be useful in some way. <laughs> so, yeah. OK, if there's no further comments, Maria and Irene, again, thank you so much for joining us today, for talking about your interesting work. I hope we thank you. Thank all of us uh, will be able to see each other in uh, in person again. I'm sure that somewhere in the first or second week of April, we will have another edition of this seminar series. So I hope to see you back then for the uh, arena. Sleep well later on. It's late for you. <laughs> and for the rest of you, I hope you have a productive day. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.